Ladies and gentlemen, this is the 16th edition of uh, this conference, and this time this is fit for Green Deal, ready for the European Green Deal. And I looked at the logotype of Paribas Bank, uh, fit for Green Deal. Yes, BNP Paribas, even here, was ready, was fit. You set trends, you're so proud about it. Even the logotype is just like the Green Deal, even before the talks on Green Deal ever started. You set trends in many areas, uh, uh, you fight for diversity and, uh, on the net, and uh, round of applause for that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the event which we witness now is getting bigger and bigger year to year. It's my pleasure to run it for many years now, and I will be your guide during the conference. And this event is getting uh, quicker because the change is changing and we need this kind of brainstorming. The meeting, for those of you who are online, is translated into English and Polish. At the top of your screen, you should choose the translation into English or Polish. The entire meeting will go on for three and a half hours. During this event, we will analyze the conditions and opportunities which the Green Deal brings along, all the challenges. We'll talk about it with the speakers, and most of us look at it and are a bit scared, but you have to look at it as an opportunity, an opportunity which can help us to change the world in good direction. So now, just watch short two-minute video, and the person you're going to listen will uh, has followed us for many nature movies, and the numbers that you're going to hear, what Kristina Czubowska Tubovna will tell us is really important. Fit for Green Deal. Fit for green Food deal. for the next Food generation. Gotowi na europejski Ready zielony ład. For the European green deal. Jeden gest nie One zmieni świata, ale od jednego world, należy zacząć. Unia Europejska aspiruje, aby do 2050 roku Europa została pierwszym kontynentem neutralnym klimatycznie. Inicjatywa stawia za cel ochrony klimatu dla nas i przyszłych pokoleń. Żadna osoba ani żaden region nie pozostaną Mamy szansę poprawić dobrobyt oraz zdrowie obywateli i przyszłych pokoleń, co zyskamy. Bezpieczną uh, przyszłość what shall we z ograniczonymi get in return? skutkami zmian klimatu, czystsze powietrze, czystszą energię, wodę i glebę, zdrowszą żywność, food, mniej odpadów, mniej pestycydów less i nawozów. And, uh, A jeśli nie podejmiemy działań, what happens o to, if we don't take action, this is what we may jeszcze za życia naszych dzieci, when during lifetime of our children, pollution, i susze, heat, and droughts. Europie, Only in Europe, 90 90,000 deaths annually because of the heat waves, 40% less water accessible in the southern part of the European Union, half a million people annually. Powodzie to suffer from flooding. Two million, two hundred thousand people annually suffer by flooding the coastal areas. 190 billion euro in annual losses in case of the average uh, temperature increase by uh, 3 centigrade. On top of that, across the world, 50 million people annually who will be forced to leave their homes as a result of river floods. 16% of species threatened if temperatures grow by 4.3 centigrade. centigrade. Nasza żywność, our food, nasze zdrowie, our health, nasza planeta, our planet, nasza przyszłość. Our future. Ważne jest, aby it is important czuć odpowiedzialność to feel the responsibility to, to, to develop business in a sustainable way, to be strong enough to be determined and to have the capacity to contribute to the development of economy and to give positive impact on customers, employees, suppliers and local communities. One gesture will not change the world, but we have to begin from the one gesture. Fit for Green Deal. Fit for green deal. Food for the, Food next, to generations. the next generations.
Gotowi na Ready europejski European Green Deal. Beautiful Worlds by Krystyna Czubów. No one gesture will not change the world, but we have to begin somewhere. So I want to invite up here the CEO of Pariba, Przemek Gdański and Bartosz Urbaniak, the Food and Agro BNP Paribas for uh, Central Eastern Europe and Africa. Hello. Well, my name was given as the first one, and I will say it as the first one, and you will adopt. But first of all, I want to welcome you, all of you who are here with us, and those of you who are with us on the network. We meet in better reality than a year ago. This time, we have a hybrid meeting. So some of you decided to join us physically. Thank you very much for that. We are happy uh, to see all of you here. After this uh, video, I haven't seen it before, but it's difficult to find an emotional calming. But I need to say some words, how we look at this reality. I want to begin with saying that to us, the Paribas Bank, Bank Polska, the agriculture sector is the priority. We are pr proud and happy that for years we have been the, the biggest bank which supports Polish agriculture. Polish food processing industry will not quit it. We want to develop there, we want to strengthen our position, and we want to, uh, to develop new skills and work with you. For the Parinba group, it is a strategic sector. I need to mention, uh, well, it's our advertisement here. Uh, we are the biggest bank in Europe, one of the 10 biggest banks uh, in uh, the uh, world. Our balance sum is five times bigger than the sum of all the assets present here in Poland. We operate in 68 countries. I want out towards Bartek. Bartek, for years now, apart from his responsibility for our business in Poland, he's the head of Food and Agri Agro Hub, which is the competence hub which we built in Warsaw, which supports many other countries in Europe and across the world in development of the sector business. And to me, this is the appreciation of the group, to our competences, to our involvement, to our conviction that this is the business which we should be supporting most actively. We live in a pandemic world. The pandemic is not that difficult as only a year ago, but it's still somewhere there in the background. That's why we are in this hybrid type of meeting and not a real physical meeting of everybody here in this room. But I need to say that the agriculture and food sector and food processing sector has uh, managed the pandemic very well. Until now. Well, we've never had any supply uh, crisis. We had our food to eat. And also, the operation, operating margins improved. And as a result, in Poland, the profitability grew by two, maybe three billion zloty in difficult times, in uncertain times, which is a proof of how advanced and mature and professional the leaders of this sector are. So, a round of applause and my congratulations to you. We'll be having other challenges ahead of us. We have the pandemic, and uh, I hope it will be soon under full control. I hope that all of us will be vaccinated. I hope that those of you who doubt about it will get vaccinated. We will be having the climate challenges, and this is what this video was about. It was very touching and moving. We know all of it, but we also know that Polish agriculture and global agriculture will need to face up to the challenges. Agriculture is responsible for 12% of the green, um, gases, green gases. We have 20% of the waste. The agriculture is using water, soil, natural resources, which are a limited uh, asset. And also, we have the European Green Deal. So now I uh, suggest that we combine our strengths, you, our friends, customers, and experts, together with us, the bankers. I believe that together we can slow down the climate changes and we can enjoy the world as we know it, as we remember it, uh, foreseeable in weathers with no uh, unexpected uh, natural catastrophes. Well, this world should be the same or even the better to all of us and also uh, 
to our children and grandchildren. This is the responsibility which is with us. We will not run away from it. We need to take it really seriously. Together we'll make it. We have to combine our forces, and this is what I want to encourage you to. And now, uh, to be on a more positive note. A lot of intellectual experience ahead of us, I'm fully convinced about it. We'll be having a joint evening. We'll have time to talk, to do the networking, to listen to good music, and we can get integrated. So I wish you a good, inspiring day, valuable intellectual experience. And so on, thank you. Well, to me, it was the first uh, time on the stage as just a decoration. We decided it would be a dialogue, but I could not really make it. And now it's my boss. He is my boss, so it's difficult. I can help you. I will. When we were talking this morning, and I told him that this video with Chubovna, that he's really impressive, and he told to, he came up to me, and he said, "Yeah, I thought that you exaggerate, but it's really expressive, and I know that all of us will uh, have been touched by that." So. I can only subscribe to what my boss has already said. Uh, I encourage you to cooperate with this conference, and I hope we'll be having nice talks, nice discussions, interesting conclusions. Enjoy. Bartek will give us one of the most important intellectual pills in the next part of this event. So it's not he's not just a background, not just a decoration, I promise. So please take your seats. And now, together with Bartosz Urbaniak, who decided it would be a very important presentation. Now, not that it's a piece of uh, um, legal act, no, but these are values. And what we, just like Kristina Tupovna has said, what we can do to protect the climate and to change the world for better. Now, soon, we'll be having Peter Schmidt, the president of the Section for Agriculture, Rural Development, and the entire and Environment, the European Economic and Social Committee. He will tell us about the Green Deal. Green Deal and from farm to fork, the new paradigm of social and economic development. And I'm really glad that you, Peter, uh, will give us an opening speech because you will uh, tell us a little bit more about basic, what Green Deal is and why it's so important. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Schmidt, the stage is yours. which we have to discuss about this. This is Peter Schmidt. I'm the current president from the so-called NACT section in the European Economic and Social Committee. But in my real life, I'm a German trade unionist, a trade unionist working in a, in a, in a, in a German trade union, in a food trade union. And uh, once someone would have asked me, Peter, once in your position, you will go to Sopot and uh, have a keynote speech in a bank as a trade unionist, I said, would have said. <laughs> Never ever they're going to invite a person like me having kind of innovative ideas, but also challenging ideas when we discuss issues like the Green Deal. And let me make you familiar a bit with the ESC that you can perhaps a bit understand what we are doing and uh, why we are on a page where the Commission is sometimes listening to us or sometimes not. The ESC is a body which is uh, already um, uh, established in the, in the treaties, um, the Roman treaties. So we have uh, 329 members. We are composed on three groups out of all the member states in, um, in, uh, in the EU. Three groups, group one is employers group, group two is the trade unions group, I come from this group, and group three is the group of the various uh, interests like farmers, uh, consumers, uh, uh, small and medium enterprises, environmentalists, and so on. And so we produce opinions, opinions on a referral of the, of the, of the commission, but we also produce opinions on our own initiative. I come later, uh, later to this. And in this, in this um, capacity, so we have six 
sections, and in these six sections, we produce on the different perspectives. It's eco section, it's in section, eco for economy, int for internal market. And I'm the current president of the NUT section. It is dealing with agriculture, food systems, sustainable development, environmental issue, and rural, uh, rural development. Means we, as uh, ESC, we are on the forefront for putting new ideas uh, on, the, on, on, the, on, the, on the table. And in the last years, I have to see whether I have here the space for my, for my notes. So and in the last years, I would say we got, in the last recent years, three main policies. Three main policies globally and uh, European-wide. I would start with the UN Agenda 2030, which was established in 2015 with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. I guess that you all are aware about the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. In the next break, I'm going to ask you uh, on a personal basis, tell me what is uh, 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 SDG 8 or what is SDG 3. But this is not the problem, not knowing exactly what the SDGs are on. The issue is, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the UN has set the frame. The frame for a pathway of the global, of the, for the global nations to go a sustainable pathway. Historians will tell us once that this was one of perhaps the game changers in the, in the, in the question how we organize ourselves, our life uh, um, sustainably. The second uh, policy is the Green Deal. In 2019, the commission came out with a, with a Green Deal, with the idea of a Green Deal, and the third one is, that's what I'm talking about today, is the farm to fork strategy. So when we talk about these three policies, we have to think this together. And I would like to show you just two slides. Don't have too many slides because I don't like uh, too many slides. It's better to have some pictures. Perhaps we can display uh, the, uh, the first slide. The first slide shows us uh, the idea of the Green Deal, you might know this, uh, I don't want to go into details, but you see what is the idea of the Commission for a sustainable Europe. And it was quite a surprise for us in the ESC that the Commission came out with this, uh, with this idea. Because already in 2019, in January 2019, the Commission set the frame on a so-called reflection paper, which says how we're going to deal with the Agenda 2030, uh, how we're going to deal with the 17 um, Sustainable Development Goals. And the ESC called for an overarching strategy in order to come to these uh, policies. And that's why we have been quite surprised that the, the, the Commission placed this green deal. And you see that it's, it's, quite, it's quite comprehensive. But setting this is from nice. No, it's nice that we have this. But the question is, what does it mean concretely in our real world? And this brings me to the, to the next slide. And if we have a look to the next slide, we see the different... Um, uh, uh, so we see the, the different targets which have been set from the, from the Commission. Uh, you might all know this, but as I said, the detail is in the end uh, the problem. And when we have a look at the targets and the, and the objectives of this, then we have to talk about, or then we see that, um, that the Commission wants to have a climate neutrality. Here is 2030 but a climate neutrality until, uh, until 2050 in the end. So, and the problem on this is that we have to set targets and have to change, and I come later to this, concretely our way of how we produce, what we produce, and the way which kind of economy in the future is fit to meet this necessary Targets and this impressive video in the, in, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the in the in the beginning of this meeting has, I think, impressively shown what is necessary is necessary uh, to do. One point out of this is that the Commission, as I said, has set the farm to fork strategy. So we, as ESC, we already started more than five years ago in. Uh, I was rapporteur on a paper, so-called 
comprehensive food policy in Europe, and we described what is necessary in order to have a sustainable food system. That's why we do not talk about agriculture system and agri system. So the ESC set the point to say we must talk about a food system. And the idea was just to, to give a picture. The idea was imagine a temple. This temple is uh, the roof is the food policy. Today we say farm to fork. Come to this. And then we have pillars on this temple. On the different pillars of this food policy is education, is transport, is healthy diets, is the common agriculture policy, and a lot of other aspects in this, uh, in this uh, comprehensive food policies in our idea. And the basement of this temple is governance. And here we come at first to the big problem when we talk about the farm to fork strategy, because we identified the biggest problem in coming to a farm to fork that means in a holistic approach across the food supply chain is a, is a lack of governance. It's a lack of governance not only in, in the EU, not only in the Commission. It's a lack of governance in all of our member states in the EU, probably also uh, uh, globally, uh, that we have a silo thinking. We all think in silos. We think in financial terms, we think in uh, economic terms, we think in, in agriculture terms, and that is, or in educational terms, and that is a wrong thinking. If you want to make the world more sustainable, that means we must come to holistic approaches. Otherwise, we won't come to a real other uh, uh, development. So, let me talk about now about the farm to fork strategy. And the question is, farm to fork, green deal, a new paradigm? And the answer is yes, it is a new paradigm. But if we do not want, or if we won't take the right steps and the right decisions, it won't be a new paradigm. And that's so important that we talk about also some details of this, uh, of this farm to fork strategy. So what are the objectives of the farm to fork strategy? So the commission says we want to have a neutral or a positive environmental impact across the food supply chain. The commission says that we must have a reverse on loss of biodiversity, which we are facing. We have in, in the last 20 years, we lost already 25% of our biodiversity, of our rich life on this, on this planet, but these are only the figures from the EU. And we have to assure the food security. And you mentioned that, uh, I have the same, the same assessment, the food supply chain worked very well in Europe. No one had to starve no one suffered on hunger. Our shelves have been always full. Okay, sometimes not every pasta was there, not every flour was there, but we could deliver. But this is Europe. In this week, we, are, we have the, the CFS in Rome, the annual conference of the FAO, the Committee of World Food Security. And what we see and face in Europe is totally different on the global level. The global level, I don't know whether you know the figures, the hunger is back. The hunger is back. In the last year, only in 2020, the hunger has increased five times in comparison uh, to before. So that means we have as Europeans also a responsibility to have a broader look, not only into the European side, we have to have a look also on the global aspect and to see how we can, we can feed uh, the world. Another, then we have some objectives in this farm to fork, and then this describes, describes quite, quite clear where are the challenges. We want to reduce the pesticide use on 50%. 50%. We want to reduce artificial fertilizers on a, on, a, on a level on 25%. And we want to have an organic production on the surface of our agricultural land 
on 25%. Now, I'm going to ask you, you, you might know that here, but I'm going to ask you here in, in this country, in Poland, how high the percentage is on the organic production. We have one best in class. We have one best in class. It is Austria. They already have 25%. In my country, we have, and some people would consider the Germans as, as, as very green, uh, really green, not only wearing the green scarves, but very, very green. But we have 10.7%. Here in Poland, we have, you know that, 3.3% of the surface is dedicated to organic production. What does that mean? What does that mean for farmers? What does that mean for the companies? What does that mean for the processing sector? And what does that mean for the marketing in the future? If we're going to start the, the journey to get 25% means we have to change our, <laughs> our nutritional patterns and we have to change our behavior. But also the processing sector must adapt and must adjust themselves on a, on a clientele, which is then probably a bit different to that what we are facing. Some figures here from Poland. I had a, bit, a, deeper, uh, a deeper look on it. Um, I was a bit really surprised. Um, for instance, a third of Polish people do not eat neither fruits nor vegetables on their daily, on their daily table. A third. And what that means for health, for all this impact, what, what this impacts, we can imagine. So the challenge for this, to explain to people that we must have a shift in our economic system and the way how we live is quite huge. And let me come, um, I have just a couple of minutes, let me come to, to some points which I want to, to, to stress uh, in order to, to, to clarify when I say we have to change our economic approaches or perhaps in some cases our economic model. I mentioned the common agriculture policy. <clears throat> 60 years ago it was well established because at that time we said we have to fight against hunger and the EU must be ready to deliver food security. But today, it's no longer the question in Europe for food security. The question today is, do we have a sustainable food system across the food supply chain? And we have to say, probably not. We have food security, but it is not really sustainable. So, and for this, we have to address some problems in the food supply chain. We have to imagine we start from the farm to the fork. The European taxpayer pays 60 billion euros per year. It's the biggest part of the EU budget. 60 billion per year in order to mitigate the problem of farmers, specifically dedicated uh, to the farmers. And this is why we say in the food supply chain, we are not really able to earn enough money you know, to, to deserve for all companies and for all in the food supply chain a fair share. And I say this is wrong. I say this is wrong. There are two reasons what we see. At first, you might say, ah, oh, where is the logic? Come to that uh, uh, later. Our food in Europe is too cheap. You would say, ah, too cheap? Yes, it is too cheap because it doesn't internalize all the costs which we have in the field. It means health, environmental costs, land use, all that what is necessary would be necessary to internalize. That brings the farmers to problems and that brings in the end of the day sometimes also the processors into, into problems. But why I'm saying the system would be fit to have a fair share in the food supply chain. I don't know whether you're aware of that. I'm in charge in my, in my real life for multinational companies, especially for the biggest in the world. I deal with them, and this morning I had a call with the biggest, with the biggest company, with the biggest food company, I don't name here, uh, uh, companies. But I don't know whether you're aware, what is the share within the food supply chain? 
I mean, the companies, they would blame and say, yeah, that's the retail sector, they are problematic, the retail sector, yeah, now they use their, their market power in order to, to take that. You have an idea what the profit is? The profit of a multinational, not the small and medium enterprises. That's totally different. The backbone of the food system. But what the, what the share or the profit of an, and that's why I said probably it's not the right place to talk about that, but I'm gonna tell you, that's the problem. Have you an idea? Had someone an idea what the, what the profit from the big multinationals is? I can tell five, six, seven, the names on that. It's 20%. 20% profit on the turnover. And at the same time, we as taxpayers pay 60 billion euros per year to mitigate the problems for farmers in the food supply chain. And that's why Ladies and gentlemen, we must have a different view on economics. We must center the people. We must center the environment in the economics, or not only the profit making. Recently, a CEO of one of the biggest, biggest companies in the food sector was fired. You know that, probably, because he said, we must have a shift in our company to more sustainable way to produce behavior. And investors, they said, oh, come on, come on, it's not necessary to do that because uh, we want to make money. And that's a problem. We must have a societal debate what it means when we talk about, when we talk about sustainable development. I'll give you another example and then I, I, I come to an end. I see that I have to, to, to keep to the time. Food companies are, to a certain extent, responsible for the loss of biodiversity. So why? It's not because they, they pollute the environment, what people would think. think. It's not because they use bad materials. I tell you, I come from the food sector. I'm in my real, real life. Once I started my, my career, I'm a cheese maker. I know what's, what's, what does it mean uh, to produce and to have real good materials to, do, to use that. No, the problem is the efficiency programs in the companies are built to reduce complexities. And everybody, everyone here, especially econom, e e e e uh, economics, uh, would say, yeah, that's good. That's, it's necessary to keep the costs low. But you know what does that mean? That means in the last 15 years, all the food companies have reduced the costs on the back of the biodiversity. Give an example. One company told me in Germany producing ice, they said, Peter, we use 41 different vanilla sorts in Germany. I didn't know that we do have so many vanilla sorts even. They said, Peter, this is not what we want. That's too complex. We're going to reduce it to five. That makes the, 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 the production lean. I said, yeah, that's a, that's a logic. This is what I said 10 years ago. But then after I understood they did the same for the pizza production. They did the same for all other productions. All ingredients has been reduced to five or two. And then they forced the farmers just to produce five tomato sorts. Go to Italy. I thought as a German, no, tomatoes are red. Okay, that that's my, was my understanding. But talk to an Italian. Tomatoes, this is a variety on food. They have 100 different, different sorts on this. Okay, come to an end, I understand. <laughs> Now let me, let me finish this, let me finish on this, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, on it. The problem is, when I say we have to change our way how we produce and we, we proceed, then we have to focus uh, on this. Farmers are now forced to produce less biodiversity than before. We must come back. We must talk about the value of food. Value of food means this is much more than a big tire on my car or another issue. We have to tell the people there is a worth in inside. So farmers start to work every day. They don't make virtual meetings like we do. They go out in the field and work every day. Workers go every day into the factory and make sure that we have food on the table proper food. And that's why I would be happy to discuss with you. I have so many other things to say here, but uh, I let it here. Thank you for the invitation. And I hope I, give you, I gave you a lot of food, a lot of different food for the debate today. Thank you very much for the invitation.